2001, a year where the winners won big and the losers vanished from existence. Where the once crowded landscape was reduced to the vision of the lone survivor. Where the would-be successors began their rush to relevance only to fall exceedingly short. Where the stars began fading from their in-ring peaks and the new class inched closer to their ascent. 2001 gave us the greatest of spectacles and disappointments of a staggering magnitude. Professional wrestling in 2001 made moments that are unforgettable for reasons good and bad. Here's everything that happened in the world of wrestling in 2001. January 4th January 4th is a date that fans of Japanese wrestling have come to recognize as an annual haven for tremendous in-ring action. 62,000 fans fill the Tokyo Dome to witness New Japan's Wrestling World 2001, where a tournament is held to crown a new IWGP Heavyweight Champion. Over the course of the evening, Kensuke Sasaki draws submissions from Satoshi Kojima and Masahiro Chono before pinning an on-loan All Japan stalwart, Toshiaki Kawada, in the finals to reclaim the gold. January 7th but while New Japan are fixing to explore continued success behind their veteran title holder, ECW is facing near certain doom. The group stages what will be its final pay-per-view guilty as charged from New York's Hammerstein Ballroom. The action proves memorable and includes two world title changes. The Sandman wins the title in a three-way ladder match, only to lose it minutes later to Rhino in an impromptu challenge. Rob Van Dam caps off the evening with a comeback match of sorts, defeating old rival Jerry Lynn. Van Dam's comeback is not from injury, however, but rather a financial dispute. He was one of many ECW stars behind on pay and was talked into working the event. Ditto Lynn, who threatened to skip out on the card if he wasn't paid some of his owed money up front. With ECW's syndicated show getting dropped by the New York-based MSG network, the writing appears to be on the wall. January 8th One of pro wrestling's most enduring theme songs debuts in the WWF, as Motorhead's The Game heralds the appearance of Triple H for the very first time. It becomes one of three Lemmy helmed songs that the future WWE COO will use over the next 20 plus years. January 10th in what is certainly not a sign of things to come for the fledgling football league, oh no, 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 the XFL blimp crashes into a waterfront restaurant in Oakland, California. The two-man crew are able to evacuate safely, though the pilot sustains minor injuries. January 11th. A deal to purchase WCW from parent company Time Warner is announced, with Eric Bischoff and Fusion Media Ventures acquiring the struggling wrestling entity. Following a year in which WCW lost over $60 million, Bischoff and company look to take the reins and return the organization to its former glory. One important detail, though, the sale will not be finalized for 45 days following a period of due diligence. January 13th. But while WCW is looking forward to a rebirth, ECW finds itself at death's door. Paul Heyman is not in attendance as the organization holds its final ever card, a hastily assembled house show in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, before a scant 1,300 fans. After the Sandman defeats Just Incredible in the evening's main event, Tommy Dreamer and the rest of the locker room file down to the ring, bringing with them two trash cans filled with beers. With no more cards left on the schedule, what's left of the ECW locker room toasts each other, as well as the fans, in a near certain curtain call. January 14th. A day later, a different sort of trauma is being felt in Indianapolis, as WCW holds its Sin pay-per-view before a crowd of just 6,600 people. The main event is meant to be notable for the surprise return of Road Warrior Animal, only for the reveal to be upstaged by a gruesome leg injury sustained by Sid Vicious when the veteran powerhouse performs a second rope maneuver. The undercard of Sin is filled with ups and downs, including a Bill Goldberg defeat in a tag team match that resulted in Goldberg being forced to leave the company. While there would have been an angle to bring him back eventually, the match does end up being Goldberg's WCW swan song. In an unintended exodus, Meng wins the WCW Hardcore title in a three-way match and then walks out of the company by week's end, since he isn't under contract. January 18th. All Japan turned Noah wrestling star Kenta Kobashi blows out his knee during a match in Tokyo. The injury is so severe that the former three-time All Japan Triple Crown champion ends up missing 13 months of action. 
January 21st. In what some consider the best card in the event's chronology, the 2001 Royal Rumble kicks off the WWF's pay-per-view calendar with a major bang, enthralling a sold-out crowd in New Orleans. The titular match is won by Stone Cold Steve Austin, making him the first and so far only three-time winner of the Royal Rumble match. Though he bleeds buckets after being jumped by Triple H on the way to the ring, Austin eliminates three men, including match Iron Man Kane, to earn a title match at WrestleMania X7. The Rumble match is a perfect blend of drama and humor, the latter category satisfied by some hardcore garbage brawling and a whimsical cameo from comedian Drew Carey. Also notable is the appearance of Haku, just days after bolting from WCW. Elsewhere on the night, Chris Jericho outlasts Chris Benoit in a scintillating ladder match to capture the Intercontinental title, while Kurt Angle edges out Triple H in a rare heel versus heel WWF title bout in which Austin attacks the challenger. January 22nd WCW World Champion Scott Steiner is arrested for striking an EMT, a legitimate one, not an actor, during an angle on the previous night's Nitro in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Oh, Scott. January 26th. After six years working for the WWF, Brian Road Dog James is fired from the company following a series of personal issues. The multi-time tag team champion and future WWE Hall of Famer won't reappear in the company for over 10 years. January 28th. Stan Hansen, one of the greatest gaijin stars in the history of Japanese wrestling, announces his retirement during the Giant Baba Memorial Spectacular at the Tokyo Dome, following a 28-year career. Among his many achievements, Hansen held the AJPW Triple Crown on four occasions, won four World's Strongest Tag Determination Leagues in the 80s, each with a different partner, and was a former AWA World Champion. January 31st. Due to inclement weather preventing the show from taking place on its original December date, Ohio Valley Wrestling's Christmas Chaos takes place on this day in Louisville, Kentucky. Because the group is WWF's developmental territory, major stars such as Steve Austin, Kane, Chris Benoit, The Hardy Boys and Lita all make appearances. Over 5,000 fans witness a 10-match card that concludes with Kane defeating Leviathan, the future Batista. February 3rd. With the WWF firmly on top of the wrestling world, Vince McMahon unleashes his newest attempt at a sporting venture when the XFL begins play. An estimated 14 million viewers tune into NBC to see the extreme take on football come to life. As the weeks pass, however, the majority of that audience will not stick around. February 4th. The David McLean operated Women of Wrestling draws an estimated 9,500 fans to the Great Western Forum in Inglewood, California for its pay-per-view, Unleashed. The 13-match card is announced by Lee Marshall and recent WCW escapee Bobby Heenan. The event was the second all-women pay-per-view in North America, following LPWA's Super Ladies Showdown in 1992. Plans for an April pay-per-view from WOW will never come to pass, as the organization ceases production about a month after this event. February 18th. WCW stages its final Super Brawl pay-per-view, titled Super Brawl Revenge, at the Municipal Auditorium in Nashville. A crowd of just 4,400 sees Kevin Nash apparently get forced into retirement after losing to WCW World Champion Scott Steiner in an overbooked main event, where Steiner loyalist Ric Flair keeps changing the rules as the match goes along. In a true sign of the times, Steiner is the only one of the five wrestlers on the event's promotional poster that actually appears on the card. February 24th. The East Coast Wrestling Association holds its annual Super 8 tournament in Wilmington, Delaware, and features a number of future industry stars. 21-year-old Low Key takes home the tournament after defeating 19-year-old American Dragon, the man we know today as Daniel Bryan, in the final match. In the quarterfinal round, Dragon outlasted a fellow trainee of the Texas Wrestling Academy in Bryan Kendrick. February 25th. Over 15,000 fans flock to Las Vegas' Thomas & Mack Center for WWF's No Way Out, which will go down as one of the greatest secondary pay-per-views in company history. On the card, Triple H outlasts Steve Austin in a 40-minute long three stages of hell match, while The Rock defeats Kurt Angle to capture the WWF Championship. This sets the stage for Rock vs. Austin at the large looming WrestleMania X7 to determine the WWF's ultimate hero. February 27th. 
But all is not so rosy within the WWF. Stacy the Cat Carter is released from the company in the middle of her and real-life husband Jerry Lawler's feud with Right to Censor, for reasons that reportedly included her being difficult to work with. In solidarity and protest, Lawler walks out of the company. March 2nd the Zero One promotion debuts at Tokyo Sumo Hall, with 11,000 fans witnessing all sorts of interpromotional warfare, including a main event that pits All Japan turned Noah headliners Jun Akiyama and Mitsuharu Misawa against Zero One founder and former New Japan icon Shinya Hashimoto and current New Japan star Yuji Nagata. March 5th. Lawler's replacement as Jim Ross's partner on Raw is War is revealed in Washington, D.C. one week after the King's walkout, as ECW owner Paul Heyman debuts in the chair next to JR. The arrival comes a single day after ECW's tentatively set March pay-per-view Living Dangerously was officially scratched from the schedules of pay-per-view providers. Heyman's appearance at the desk also comes as news to some ECW wrestlers that were still holding out hope that the company was not yet officially dead, since Heyman reportedly hadn't confirmed as such to them. But with Just Incredible debuting on Raw the previous month and Rhino and Spike Dudley to follow in March, as well as Jerry Lynn in April, there seems to be little hope. March 14th with public perception of the XFL continuing to bottom out, Vince McMahon sits down for what turns out to be a surreal interview with Bob Costas on HBO's On The Record. McMahon takes aggressively defensive stances as Costas questions him about the salaciousness of both his football league and his wrestling programming, chiefly the recent bit of denigration involving Trish Stratus. Over the 30-minute interview, a clearly amused Costas calmly fires off one talking point after another, while an increasingly agitated McMahon gives answers that range from fair and measured to confrontational and bitterly sarcastic. March 16th. The sale of WCW to Eric Bischoff and Fusiant once appeared certain, but has grown cloudier with each passing week that the deal isn't finalized. Then the hammer drops swiftly. New Turner Broadcasting CEO Jamie Kellner makes the decision to cancel all wrestling programming on their networks. The final show on WCW's schedule is the March 26th episode of Monday Nitro. With no cable time slots for the product, Fusiant and Bischoff pull out of the deal altogether. This move ends a 29-year union between Turner Broadcasting and professional wrestling, one that will not be rekindled until 2019 when upstart promotion All Elite Wrestling is granted a two-hour program entitled Dynamite. March 17th. Scott Norton defeats Kensuke Sasaki to win the IWGP heavyweight title at Hyper Battle in Nagoya, kicking off Norton's second and final reign with the belt. March 18th. With the company virtually at death's door, WCW holds its final pay-per-view, Greed, at the Memorial Coliseum in Jacksonville before an agonizing 5,000 fans. Perhaps appropriately, the penultimate match of the night is a tag team bout that pits territorial icons Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair on opposing teams. The final WCW pay-per-view match ever sees world champion Scott Steiner defeat Diamond Dallas Page. March 23rd. A war officially ends. The WWF purchases numerous WCW assets, including trademarks, the video library, and the contracts of 24 on-air performers from Turner Broadcasting. In total, the WWF spends a reported $4.2 million to acquire the assets, far less than the estimated $48 million that Fusiant had previously offered for the company, with the cable time slots intact, of course. March 26th. The final ever WCW Monday Nitro and WCW program overall is broadcast from the Boardwalk Beach Resort in Panama City, Florida. The fans on hand witness a night filled with title matches, including Booker T capturing his fourth WCW world title from Scott Steiner. And in an emotional final match for the company, Sting defeats old rival Ric Flair. Nitro's overlapping hour with Raw is War is simulcast in parts, particularly Nitro's final scenes. As an exultant Vince McMahon, McMahon vows the thorough dismantling of his recently purchased rival up in Cleveland, Shane McMahon suddenly appears in Panama City to reveal that he finalized the contract himself and managed to buy WCW just before his father did. The final WCW Nitro scene is one of McMahon family melodrama. March 27th. 
Amid tentative plans for an in-ring comeback, Shawn Michaels is sent home from a SmackDown taping by Vince McMahon, after it becomes apparent to those backstage that the former world champion is still battling his personal demons. This incident is one of several that eventually leads Michaels to cleaning up and turning his life around. March 28th at a meeting of 140 remaining WCW staffers at the company's training facility in Smyrna, Georgia, the vast majority of them are terminated effective March 30th with severance and are told to clean out their offices. March 30th Famed wild man Pero Aguayo loses his hair to Universo 2000 in front of 17,000 CMLL fans in Mexico City. Aguayo retires following the match and will stay in retirement for four years afterwards. April 1st. The consensus peak of American pro wrestling is achieved at Houston's Astrodome, as WrestleMania X7 sets new standards in show quality and in wrestling box office. A reported 67,000 plus fans fill the venue, paying a then US record $3.5 million at the gate, while the event is WWF's first to achieve 1 million pay per view buys. Memorable moments from Linda's clever revenge on Vince to a TLC stunt show for the ages to Raven getting mowed down by a golf cart provide the evening's most enduring images. That TLC match registers as a WrestleMania instant classic, as does a map-based struggle between Kurt Angle and Chris Benoit. The main event between The Rock and Steve Austin was another legendary battle, but with a caveat. Soundtrack by Limp Bizkit's My Way, the battle of two heroes vying for the WWF title is built masterfully, and its execution matched the supercharged hype. But the ending, in which Austin colludes with sworn enemy Vince to defeat Rock, signaling Austin's surprise heel turn, jars the course of the last major promotion standing going forward. April 4th the HHG Corporation, parent company of ECW, officially files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy with debts totaling close to $7.5 million. April 9th Just 23 days after capturing the IWGP heavyweight title, Scott Norton drops it in Osaka to Pride Fighting star Kazuyuki Fujita, who reigns for much of the remainder of 2001. April 14th in a year where both WCW and ECW went under, another long-running institution meets its end, as Memphis's Saturday morning WMC TV program ends after several decades on the air. Over the preceding three years, the slot had belonged to Power Pro Wrestling, a WWF developmental group that was, in some respects, the spiritual continuation of Jerry Lawler's USWA. April 15th Mitsuharu Misawa becomes the first winner of Pro Wrestling Noah's GHC heavyweight title, defeating Yoshihiro Takayama in a tournament final in Tokyo. April 16th Future multi-time world champion Brock Lesnar wrestles his first match before a Federation crowd, teaming with Shelton Benjamin in a dark match at a Raw taping in Knoxville, Tennessee. Lesnar finishes the match by hitting a shooting star press. April 21st the loan season of the original XFL concludes when the Los Angeles Extreme decimate the San Francisco Demons 38-6 in what is dubbed the Million Dollar Game. Interest in the veritable laughingstock of a league has plummeted to such lows that the TV rating for the championship game was merely one quarter of what the opening game of the season drew. April 24th Johnny Valentine, a holder of many territorial championships, including the NWA United States title and the father of Greg the Hammer Valentine, passes away at age 72. Considered one of the toughest wrestlers of all time, Valentine was most prominent in territories like Mid-Atlantic, Florida, and Toronto, among others. Valentine's career sadly came to a halt after he was paralyzed in the same 1975 plane crash that nearly ended the career of a young Ric Flair. The same day, Steve Carino affirmed his old-school affinity when he defeats Mike Rapada in Tampa to become the NWA World Champion. April 29th With Steve Austin now firmly a heel, he headlines WWF Backlash alongside former enemy Triple H, defending their world and intercontinental titles against tag team champions Kane and The Undertaker in a winners-take-all main event. The so-called two-man power trip walks away with all the gold before over 15,000 fans in Chicago. Alarming, though, is the pay-per-view audience, as the 375,000 buys are down 44% from one year earlier. May 4th 
The Mummy Returns opens in cinemas, featuring The Rock in a brief but notable role as the Scorpion King. Though the part is only prominent in the movie's opening, The Rock's fame, as partially evidenced by the movie's $435 million worldwide gross, will spawn a standalone prequel film with him as leading man, to be released in 2002. May 5th. WWF stages its spring UK pay-per-view insurrection before 16,000 strong at Earl's Court in London. The mostly anodyne event is notable for the finish, in which fans pelt Steve Austin and Triple H with an estimated 100 to 150 bottles, some of them glass, when the heels are left alone in the ring. May 7th. One of the most infamous squash matches of all time is filmed, as Perry Saturn manhandles enhancement talent Mike Bell during a taping of WWF Jacked. After taking a few clunky hip tosses and coming down on his head, Saturn throws genuine strikes at Bell and sends him careening to the floor in an unsafe manner. For his actions, Saturn is briefly sent home. May 10th. The XFL officially folds, less than three weeks after the championship game of its lone season. The WWF and NBC post an estimated combined loss of $70 million on the venture. May 19th. Though known for their ultra-violent product, Combat Zone Wrestling holds their first annual Best of the Best, a junior heavyweight tournament in Seoul, New Jersey. The competition features notable talents, including Juventud Guerrera, Minoru Fujita, and The Amazing Red, among others. Most talked about is a scintillating quarterfinal match between brothers Jay and Mark Briscoe, aged 17 and 16 at the time. May 20th. WWF's Judgment Day is a decent, if largely unspectacular affair, drawing over 13,000 fans to Sacramento's Arco Arena. The biggest surprise of the night is Chris Jericho and mystery partner Chris Benoit winning a tag team turmoil match to earn a future title shot. May 21st. In the absence of The Rock, who's off gallivanting in Hollywood at this time, the WWF attempts to elevate Chris Jericho and Chris Benoit as temporary headliners, putting them over tag champ Steve Austin and Triple H on Raw is War in one of the greatest matches in the show's history. Marring the occasion, however, is Triple H suffering a torn quadriceps during the closing stages. The injury shelves the game for the remainder of 2001. May 22nd. To capitalize on Jericho and Benoit's big win, the two compete in the first ever TLC match on free TV, as they outlast match veterans Edge and Christian, the Hardy Boys, and the Dudley Boys on SmackDown. Just 24 hours after Triple H's serious injury, however, Benoit sustains a legitimate neck injury during the match. Though he wrestles for the next month, he will eventually be sidelined for one year after undergoing surgery. May 28th. Raw is War is held in Calgary, with members of the Hart family, including Patriarch Stew, situated in the front row. The family appearance proves to be controversial, as it was later referred to by Bret Hart, who was still at odds with the company, as a hollow attempt to show that the Harts and the WWF had made peace. The main event in which Steve Austin defeats Chris Benoit ends with a Montreal reenactment, with Vince McMahon himself once more calling for the bell. Earlier that day, Grandmaster Sexay of Too Cool is fired from WWF after being caught in possession of drugs while crossing the border into Canada. On a positive note from this Raw, Countryman Lance Storm debuts for the company, running in as the first WCW invader attacking Perry Saturn. June 4th. Jushin Thunder Liger becomes the first man to win New Japan Pro Wrestling's Best of the Super Juniors tournament three times, and does so by running the table in the 2001 tourney. After cleaning out the A block, Liger defeats Minoru Tanaka in the overall final after a 26-minute outing. The same day, Eddie Guerrero is sent home from a Raw is War taping after being found in no condition to work. At this stage, Guerrero's personal issues have escalated to the point where WWF opts to send him to rehab. June 8th. Though a New Japan wrestler and promotional icon, Keiji Muto defeats All Japan Triple Crown Champion Genichiro Tenryu in Tokyo to capture the title. Muto vs Tenryu goes on to win the match of the year in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards, despite the two men having a combined age of 89. June 11th. For the first time ever, Kurt Angle busts out a top of the cage moonsault, attempting the maneuver onto Chris Benoit during a steel cage match on Roy's War in Richmond, Virginia. June 18th. 
Diamond Dallas Page reveals himself as the mysterious stalker that's been recording videos of The Undertaker's then-wife, Sarah. Page, of course, will go on to align himself with the amassing WCW contingent that's been appearing on WWF programming over the preceding weeks. Because he was under contract with AOL Time Warner instead of WCW itself, Page agrees to a buyout of his existing contract in order to sign with the WWF. June 20th the WWF cuts ties with its Memphis developmental group, reassigning some of its talents to their other developmental arms while releasing others. Among the cuts are future stars Joey Mercury, Brian Kendrick, and Daniel Bryan. June 21st. Though she's reigned as WWF's women's champion since April 1st, China learns that the WWF is ending contract negotiations with her and will be cutting ties with her after her deal expires on November 30th. Her final appearance with the company came at Judgment Day the prior month, where she retained her belt over Lita. Though she's on her way out of the company, she doesn't actually lose the belt in the ring, and the title is instead quietly vacated. On the same date, WWF premieres reality series Tough Enough on MTV. The show follows the trials and tribulations of 13 wrestling hopefuls as they train under the tutelage of several WWF stars. June 22nd Though it may sound hard to believe today, a plan is drafted by the WWF to rebrand their Monday night program to WCW Raw. The WWF informs cable network TNN of the impending change, as the idea at the time was to run Raw as a WCW brand, with Shane McMahon assuming control, while SmackDown would be the primary home of the WWF, a brand extension of sorts. June 24th the 2001 King of the Ring earns its place in history for the beating sustained by Shane McMahon during the semi-main event. Almost 18,000 fans in East Rutherford, New Jersey watch in amazement as Kurt Angle harshly sends McMahon careening into glass fixtures that are part of the entrance set, only for them to not immediately break on impact. The titular tournament is won by Edge, whom the WWF is preparing for a babyface singles push. And though Steve Austin manages to retain his title in the main event, he's attacked at one juncture by an invading Booker T, bringing another established top guy into the mix. June 25th. Inside the WWF sanctified home turf of Madison Square Garden, the WCW Blitz continues as ostensible outsider Mike Awesome pins hardcore champion Rhino following a backstage attack to win the title. June 27th. The final ever wrestling show at the famed Louisville Gardens takes place as OVW holds the last dance. A crowd of 3,000 sees a host of WWF stars stop by for a night as Chris Jericho loses to heavyweight champion Flash Flanagan, while Undertaker and Kane headline going over on the unusual team of DDP and the future Batista. July 2nd. Plans for a standalone WCW under WWF's watch hit the wall when a Booker T Buff Bagwell main event test match on Roy's War is soundly booed out of the venue in Tacoma, Washington. The negative response, as well as Bagwell's lackluster performance, go a long way in Vince McMahon rethinking the notion of propping up WCW as a unique property on par with his WWF. July 9th. Following the disaster of the previous week, the WWF books a stunner of an angle wherein a reborn ECW joins the invasion, as Rob Van Dam and Tommy Dreamer aid Lance Storm and Mike Awesome in an attack on WWF stars Kane and Chris Jericho. A cell of WWF wrestlers join the fray, only to all join the ECW cause, following the slow realization that all of them have ECW ties. Paul Heyman leaves the commentary desk to act as a mouthpiece for the reunited tribe of hardcores. By night's end, ECW and WCW become one, henceforth known as The Alliance, with Stephanie McMahon revealed as the owner of ECW to compliment brother Shane owning WCW. July 16th. Bruising heavyweight and founding freebird Terry Gordy passes away from a blood clot induced heart attack at age 40. In his story career, Gordy won the All Japan Triple Crown on two occasions, reigned seven times as a world tag team champion within the company, and won tag team gold in territories like Mid South, Georgia, and Dallas, as well as WCW. Son Ray and daughter Miranda will later follow Gordy's footsteps into the business. July 20th. Though ECW is now a vital part of WWF's on-air canon, the company actually has to reach a legal agreement to use the ECW name, as it was now the intellectual property of a trustee in the midst of ECW's bankruptcy filing. When ECW as a faction debuted on July 9th, it was without the necessary authorization, opening WWF up to the possibility of legal recourse. July 22nd. 
Though many major WCW names are still under their Time Warner deals, the WWF goes on with its Invasion pay-per-view, with nearly 18,000 fans filling Cleveland's Gund Arena. The anticipation remains high, to the point where the 770,000 pay-per-view buys are more than any non-WrestleMania in WWE history, and yes, that includes Summer Slams and Royal Rumbles. At the time, Invasion is the fourth most bought WWF pay-per-view ever, trailing only the preceding three WrestleManias. Eleven matches pit the WWF heroes against the assorted rivals of WCW and ECW. Match of the Night honors go to Rob Van Dam's winning of the hardcore title from fellow Daredevil Jeff Hardy. In the 5 on 5 main event, Steve Austin turns for the second time in six nights, double-crossing Kurt Angle and allowing him to be pinned by Booker T. Austin is then positioned as the leader of the Alliance. July 24th. History is made when the WCW World title changes hands on WWF programming as Kurt Angle unseats Booker T at a SmackDown taping in his native Pittsburgh. July 27th. Jun Akiyama outlasts Mitsuharu Misawa to win Noah's GHC heavyweight title in Tokyo following a classic 24-minute battle. The same day, Ronda Singh, an internationally renowned brawler best known as Monster Ripper, passes away from disputed causes at age 40. A dominant figure for All Japan Women's as well as Puerto Rico's WWC, Singh also reigned as WWF's women's champion as a comedic character named Bertha Fay in 1995. July 29th. Charismatic deathmatch legend Atsushi Onita wins a seat in Japan's House of Counselors. Following the path of fellow wrestlers Antonio Inoki and Hiroshi Hase from the ring to a spot in the Japanese diet. July 30th. After four months away, The Rock returns to the WWF at Roy's War in Philadelphia. In the evening's concluding angle, The Rock affirms his support for the WWF, but takes the opportunity to beat Vince McMahon up anyway. The segment is Raw's highest rated in one year, and the show itself is the highest rated since Raw's move to TNN in September of 2000. On the same card, Kurt Angle drops the WCW world title back to Booker T, allowing Booker to make the five-time claim in perpetuity. Or until 2006 anyway. On a sad note for the day, former NWA promoter and president Dennis Coraluzzo passes away from a brain hemorrhage at age 48. Coraluzzo was a notable player in the 1994 controversy in which reigning ECW champion Shane Douglas disavowed the NWA world title upon winning it, as part of ECW's breakaway from the jurisdiction of Coraluzzo and the rest of the NWA. August 9th. Following years of legal issues regarding trademarks and logos, a London High Court finds in favour of the World Wildlife Fund over Vince McMahon's wrestling company, putting the future use of WWF in a wrestling sense in question. The fund successfully argued that the wrestling side violated a 1994 agreement to limit usage of its initials in marketing. McMahon's enterprise went on to appeal this decision. That night, the fourth and final Brian Pillman Memorial Show is held at a high school in Cincinnati, Ohio and boasts a whopping 17 matches featuring wrestlers from all ends of the industry. Future headliners such as Randy Orton, Nigel McGuinness, and the man eventually known as Umaga fill out the vast undercard. Following a tag team match victory, Dean Malenko gives what sounds to many like his retirement speech, and indeed, he's only performed in one match since. August 11th. An attempt to pick up where the departed ECW left off comes in the form of Main Event Championship Wrestling, which runs a heavily promoted event at the ECW Arena in Philadelphia. 1,300 fans witness a card loaded with ECW alums as well as Kurt Hennig, Buff Bagwell, A Young Abyss, and others. Things fall apart, however, when checks begin bouncing, future events run into numerous issues, and promoter John Collins fakes a heart attack to try and divert his troubles. MECW dissolves shortly thereafter. August 12th. The 2001 G1 Climax is won by Yuji Nagata, defeating reigning All Japan Triple Crown Champion Keiji Muto in the overall final. Nagata had previously lost a tiebreaker match to Muto in the 1999 tournée. August 16th. Nearly two years into its run, WWF SmackDown debuts a brand new set, complete with the oversized fist that hovers over the entranceway. The previous set was given a notable send-off as Rhino gored Chris Jericho through it the preceding week. August 19th. 
SummerSlam is the latest major battleground for WWF versus the Alliance, drawing over 15,000 fans to San Jose's Compact Center. While Kurt Angle was unable to win Steve Austin's WWF title due to referee shenanigans, The Rock sends everyone home happy by winning the WCW world title from Booker T. Earlier that day, without too much fanfare, WWF Superstars ends production after close to 15 years on the air. Originally WWF's primary weekend broadcast, Superstars ran in syndication from 1986 to 1996 before migrating to the USA Network. Eventually, Superstars became a weekend recap show, making it ultimately expendable in the grand scheme of things. And sadly, former UFC heavyweight turned New Japan star Brian Fury Johnston suffered a stroke in Saitama, Japan that ultimately proved to be career-ending. Johnston competed in the 2000 G1 Climax and was a stablemate of Yuji Nagata. A regular in the early days of UFC, Johnston fought against the likes of Don Fry, Mark Coleman and Ken Shamrock inside the Octagon. August 20th Milk O Mania. That's it. That's all there is to say. It's all about the visual of Kurt Angle spraying milk from a giant hose at a group of people. Really? You know why this is here. August 25th. WWF debuts a new late night program titled Excess, airing for two hours on Saturday nights, filling the secondary program void left by both superstars and the also axed Livewire. Originally hosted by Jonathan Coachman and Trish Stratus, Excess begins as a hybrid call-in slash studio show with recaps of the Federation's goings on. The show will last for nine months and undergo several retoolings along the way. September 4th. SmackDown airs live from Toronto in an attempt to keep a taped Thursday airing from going head-to-head -head with the MTV Music Awards. On a night where Rob Van Dam defeats Alliance ally Steve Austin in a non-title bout, the heel faction gains the services of Chronic, former WWF stars Brian Adams and Brian Clark. The two appear at the behest of Stevie Richards, attacking The Undertaker. September 8th. For the first time ever, the officially recognized WWF and WCW World Champions square off in a singles match, as WCW Champion The Rock defeats WWF Champion Steve Austin by disqualification at a live event in Dallas before 15,600 fans. 15,600. A house show. September 13th. In light of the September 11th attacks in the United States, the WWF postpones its Tuesday night SmackDown taping in Houston, opting to hold the show live on Thursday night, with almost all storyline pretense abandoned. Though much of the night includes heartfelt sentiment from the WWF stars during a dark and uncertain time, particularly Lillian Garcia's emotional rendition of the Star Spangled Banner, Stephanie McMahon earns heavy criticism for questionable remarks made in her in-show testimonial. In further fallout from the attacks, the WWF opts to put Armageddon, the name of the December pay-per-view, on hold for 2001. They then introduce Vengeance as a replacement. Vengeance will remain in the naming rotation for 2002 and beyond, even after Armageddon is reinstated the same year. September 23rd. Unforgiven takes place in Pittsburgh before close to 14,000 fans. The WWF title match between Steve Austin and Kurt Angle already had the hook of Angle trying to win the title before his family and hometown crowd, but now there's increased patriotic fervor behind the Olympic hero. Indeed, Angle manages to submit Austin to his ankle lock en route to an emotionally charged second world title win. The night also marks the quick end of Chronic in the WWF as the two are bounced from the invasion angle following a disastrous match against Undertaker and Kane. September 27th. The first season of WWF Tough Enough concludes with two winners. The female winner is Nydia Gernard, beating out Taylor Matheny, the current wife of Brian Kendrick. And on the male side, Maven Huffman takes first place, outlasting Christopher Nowinski and Josh Matthews. September 28th. On or around this date, the WWF parts ways with Kay Quick. The real-life Ron Killings will eventually find his way back to the organization and demonstrate far greater lasting power than most would have figured in 2001. October 7th. Gentleman Chris Adams, a former judo champion who carved out a prolific wrestling career, was shot to death during a scuffle with a friend in Texas at the age of 46. Adams' greatest years in American wrestling came during the 1980s, where he famously teamed and feuded with Gino Hernandez in Dallas' world class. Adams is also the man who popularized the superkick as a finishing move, and he trained Steve Austin to be a wrestler in the late 80s. October 8th. 
Steve Austin wins his final world title, defeating Kurt Angle to regain the WWF Championship on Raw is War in Indianapolis. Late in the match, Commissioner William Regal strikes Angle with the championship belt, signaling a defection to the Alliance. October 13th. The NWA World Heavyweight title is held up due to a stoppage in a match pitting Steve Carino against Shinya Hashimoto at the 53rd anniversary show in St. Petersburg. A bloody Carino was apparently knocked out of one juncture, resulting in the stoppage. On the same date, XPW stages the first exploding ring match in the history of US wrestling, as Supreme defeats Vic Grimes in Pico Rivera, California. October 14th. After 18 consecutive sellouts inside the hallowed halls of Madison Square Garden, the longest in the Federation's history in fact, WWF fails to sell it out for a Sunday house show. Linda McMahon announces that same day that the WWF would be donating $1 million to New York's 9-11 relief fund. October 21st. WWF presents no mercy before over 16,000 fans in St. Louis. Away from the further battles in the increasingly tedious feud between the WWF and the Alliance, Chris Jericho defeats fellow WWF loyalist The Rock to become WCW champion, capturing the first world title of his career. October 22nd. Japanese star Hayabusa is paralyzed as the result of a botched kibrada during an FMW event at Tokyo's Korokan Hall. The heart and soul of FMW, for which she had performed as the character since 1995, never wrestles again, but does regain the use of his legs many years later. October 26th. The upstart World Wrestling All-Stars concludes a week-long tour of Australia. The final event is a pay-per-view entitled Inception, which draws 8,500 fans to the Sydney Superdome. The roster is filled with many familiar ex-WWF and WCW stars and concludes with Jeff Jarrett defeating Road Dogg in a tournament final to become the organization's champion. October 28th. X-Pac successfully defends the light heavyweight title against Scotty Too Hotty at a house show in Lexington, Kentucky. The result is significant because X-Pac is subsequently written out to have surgery, and the light heavyweight belt gets shifted out in favor of the WCW Cruiserweight title going forward. X-Pac will, however, defend the belt a few times at house shows in March of 2002, before returning to TV sans belt as part of the new NWO. November 3rd. Tickets go on sale for 2002's WrestleMania X8 at the Sky Dome in Toronto. Within 48 hours, over 51,000 tickets are sold to the tune of over $3.5 million. That night, the WWF holds its other annual UK pay-per-view, Rebellion, before 15,000 fans in Manchester. Overall, the event is a fun card with quality matches, but little memorable action. Outside the awesome visual of Edge leaving Christian hanging upside down with his feet bound by wrist tape during a steel cage match. November 4th. Helen Hart, matriarch of the legendary Hart family, passes away at the age of 77. Hart had 12 children with husband Stu, including eight boys that went on to become wrestlers in some form, and four daughters that each married wrestlers. The American-born Hart occasionally appeared on WWF programming as at least a peripheral part of some family-related storyline. November 5th. The Rock regains the WCW title from Chris Jericho in the main event of Roy's War in Uniondale, New York. Jericho attacks Rock afterward though, casting doubt in their ability to work cohesively for Team WWF in a forthcoming winner-take-all match at Survivor Series. November 8th. Amid a decline in business, the WWF lays off 39 company employees, about 9% of its existing workforce. At the time, it's the largest layoff in company history. November 12th. Three days following a vehicular incident outside the gated community where he was staying, for which he was arrested, Eddie Guerrero is released from the WWF. The arrest and release prove to be pivotal moments for Guerrero, who proceeds to get clean once and for all, while rebuilding his career through subsequent indie appearances. November 13th. In the final run-up to Survivor Series, Paul Heyman famously dresses down Vince McMahon for ripping off ECW's core concepts and thriving with them, while ECW withered to an early death. The impassioned tirade comes to an end when Taz chokes Heyman out, in response to one of Heyman's pointed asides. The same day, the startup X Wrestling Federation holds TV tapings in Orlando. Tony Schiavone and Jerry Lawler are on the call for two days' worth of filming that features icons such as Hulk Hogan, The Road Warriors, and Kurt Hennig, as well as future stars like Carlito, Christopher Daniels, and AJ Styles. 
November 16th. SmackDown Just Bring It hits stores, the first WWF game to be made available for PlayStation 2. The additions of commentary, six and eight man matches, and a reversal system earn praise, while a major negative is the somewhat outdated roster, due to production deadlines coming right as the invasion started. November 18th. Speaking of that cursed invasion, it comes to a merciful end at Survivor Series as the WWF vanquishes the Alliance before 10,000 fans, only 8,000 of them paid, in Greensboro, North Carolina. In the all-important 5-on-5 five -five main event, The Rock is the last man standing, last eliminating Steve Austin following a double-double cross from Kurt Angle, who had defected to the Alliance weeks earlier. Most of the Alliance is banished from TV, save for select title holders and other immune talents. This includes includes former ECW performer Jazz, who had just debuted in the match to crown a new women's champion and will now be going away for an indeterminate period. Said match is won by Trish Stratus, giving Stratus the first of her seven women's world titles. November 19th. Tons of resetting takes place during the follow-up Raw in Charlotte. Jerry Lawler returns to the field after eight and a half months away, replacing a fired Paul Heyman on commentary. Ric Flair makes his return to the company after eight years and is presented as a surprise part owner after buying the shares of the excommunicated Shane and Stephanie McMahon. And Mick Foley makes his last WWF appearance for a year and a half, departing from the company after several creative disagreements. On the front of active roster changes, Kurt Angle remains a heel in spite of his heroic save the night before, while Steve Austin is turned babyface, presented in such a way that it made the prior eight months feel like nothing but a bad dream. The night also births the Vince McMahon Kiss My Ass Club, which William Regal is compelled to join for the sake of his employment. November 26th. The Undertaker inexplicably turns heel, marking his first turn in over two years when he attacks Jim Ross during a closing angle on Roy's war and forces him into Vince McMahon's club. November 29th. A tribute show is held in honor of Yokozuna in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and is attended by a number of WWF stars, including The Undertaker, Kane, The APA, and others. In the main event, Rikishi reunites with old head shrinker's partner Samu to defeat the Hit Squad. December 1st. Scott Steiner wrestles his first match since the closure of WCW, taking part in a triple threat match with Jeff Jarrett and Road Dogg in Birmingham, England for World Wrestling All-Stars. December 4th. Ed Whalen, the famed voice of Stampede Wrestling, passes away at age 74, days after suffering a heart attack. Whalen was the lead announcer and interviewer for the Calgary Territory from the early 60s to the latter part of the 80s, and was noted for having a kindly, rather folksy broadcast style. The same night, Vince McMahon's club comes to an abrupt end when The Rock forces his face into the backside of a returning Rikishi during an episode of SmackDown. December 9th. Close to 12,000 fans in San Diego witnessed the unification of the WWF and WCW world titles, as Chris Jericho wins what is functionally a four-man tournament at Vengeance. After defeating The Rock to win the WCW belt, Jericho upset Steve Austin to capture the WWF gold, following an assist from Booker T. The event is the final pay-per-view to air on UK free television on Channel 4. December 11th. Kazuyuki Fujita, reigning IWGP heavyweight champion since April 9th, is forced to vacate the title after injuring his Achilles while training. Fujita was scheduled to defend the belt against Yuji Nagata at the Tokyo Dome on January 4th. It's the third time in just over three years that the IWGP heavyweight title has been held up. December 13th, one of the most memorable and most loved skits in the history of WWF SmackDown airs as Steve Austin messily brawls with Booker T all over a grocery store. Look at it! Oh, it's just the best, this, this is wrestling. December 15th. Russ Haas, the younger brother of Charlie Haas and three-year wrestling pro, passes away from heart failure at age 27. Like his brother, Russ had been a wrestling standout at Seton Hall University. The Haas brothers had been WWF developmental projects for some time and helped tag team gold across several indies. Following Russ's death, Charlie made the habit of writing Russ on his wrist tape in tribute. That same night, Shinya Hashimoto becomes the NWA World Heavyweight Champion, defeating Steve Carino and Gary Steele in a one-night round-robin tournament in McKeesport, Pennsylvania. December 31st. 
Kevin Nash's Time Warner deal expires, freeing him up to sign wherever he wants. Negotiations between Nash and the WWF took place before Christmas, but nothing has been agreed upon as of yet. And that was 2001 in wrestling! What a year!